Did you actually visit the site of the Derelict Studio? Yeah, that we shot all that. So okay. we went down there. there was like, we took Malcolm and Dave <coughs> who built the studio. Um, we took them with us because we were going to have a scene where they kind of walked around, but it was a bit too like the doco muscle shoals. Um, so we didn't. We used it as a. I think there's a BTS coming out of that. But um, yeah, we went to the studio. And we went and shot all the stuff at the base of the volcano and all those interiors at the end. What did it feel like? actually walking through the remains of this studio for the first time. I actually felt like it was really de depressing and like kind of like when you're walking on someone's land, you know, when you know that you're not meant to, not meant to be there, but, and I felt like it was quite dangerous because Cody is a very go-getter and she was like, all right, we're going to walk in. And she was like a 15 minute walk with big camera equipment and drone and carrying tripods and because Hugh had so much equipment, but yeah, and then the police said that we had to turn the cars around so if there was a problem, you'd run back and you'd be facing out from the volcano so you could get out quickly and you can hear it. So it's like, you know, it's as safe as um, <laughs> living under an active volcano. Like no one lives there because it's dangerous. So I felt like it was um, quite eerie and, yeah, I was waiting for Cody to say, oh, this is too dangerous, we'll just use the drone. But she wanted to go into buildings and see things and, you know, and so, yeah, it's all fun and games until a volcano goes off. Yeah. And this is a, a quip that we made during the, the interview, but seriously, is there enough material in there for like a part two? Did you have that much material? I mean, you could have maybe done it as a five, six part Netflix show, I guess, because there's a lot of the police and, you know, there was a bands, I guess, that we didn't go into. I mean, it always comes down to access. Like, we would have liked to get Eric Clapton. We didn't. We would have liked to, you know, get Alton John. Um, but, yeah, there was definitely a lot to cram in there. Um, and you could, yeah, I guess you could have made a five-part series and you could have fleshed out George Martin and fleshed out the whole Air backstory and Air London and Beatles as a chapter and then the island and, yeah. It probably could have been a shot TV series, but I don't think we're going to do that. <laughs> and do you have any idea how the film is travelling so far or is it a bit too early? <laughs> It's number one on iTunes. It's been for like two weeks, which is cool, for, for documentaries. Um, yeah, I mean, so many people have seen it, which is great, and it's all been really positive. Like, there hasn't really been much negative around it. I mean, it is a celebration kind of film. It is a, you know, it's not a film that could be easily, you know, it's hard to kind of attack it because it's a celebration of, like, great music and a great time. Just to talk about some of your other projects, um, yep. You directed several episodes of Bump and you directed the entire second season of Other Guy. Can you tell me, is there a significant difference between directing a few episodes of a run as opposed yeah. to directing an entire run of a <clears throat> se season? Yeah, definitely. Like, I think Other Guy was great because I – had no idea like I was thrown in the deep end I kind of turned up on the first day I'd actually tried to get a job being uh, a director's attachment on um, Jocelyn Morehouse's show because I worked out for a female director the kind of way in is to be an attachment you maybe get an episode and she had agreed to do it and then I think Screen Australia I don't know if they pay for it or someone pays for those attachments and then they kind of knocked me back after I got the job and I knew I wasn't going to get paid that much but I rented a you know, I moved out of home because I never really lived in Sydney and thought I'll be working on a show for four months. And then I got, yeah, told that I was too experienced for them to do the attachment. And I was like, but I just did a short film. I've done a short film for eight years. I've done a lot of fashion. I've done a feature doc, but I haven't done TV. So I was really upset. And then my agent, Jean, from Yellow Agency, was like, oh, go and meet with Angie and Polly and Matt O'Kan at Aquarius. And I went to the meeting. And I remember Jocelyn Morehouse's show was in pre-production in the other room. So I was so embarrassed like outside of my car and then I went to meet them and yeah usually when you pitch on an ad you do like a 70 page document and you know you really tell them what you're going to do and with this I just had said a few things in the meeting that where I thought the scripts could improve or whatever and just talked about like yeah working on short form and big budget ads and doco and yeah and then I went to New York to shoot an ad and then the day before I was leaving my agent was like you've got to go meet the head of Stan 
And I was like, what? And then she was like, yeah, I think you're going to get the whole series. And I was like, whoa. And then I was in pre-production like a week later with our, um, next to where Jocelyn's place was. And I was like, oh, I'm so glad I'm actually the director, not the director's attachment. So, but, you know, it was actually Billy Pleffer, who's Jill Armstrong's daughter. She's a family friend. And she was in Melbourne when I was doing this ad. And basically she'd done an online series and showed me her book and how she did everything and gave me which a lot of directors don't do, just sat down with me for like three hours and went through everything that how she had done stuff and like little tricks to, you know, she said, if you're not getting what you want, like change the lens and then the producers think that you're doing a different shot and you can kind of work on a scene a bit better and just gave me some tips. And because Shannon Murphy and a lot of directors are like, oh, how many days do you have and all that? And I was like, I don't know, like it's just the whole series and it's like 20 something days or, you know, they're like, oh, you don't have enough time. And anyway, so that was, it, it, that was a great experience because I got to when you're the setup. Well, it wasn't set up direct. It was set up director, but because it was season two, it being my first time, it was great because Matt and Harriet knew the characters so well. And then it was I got to choose all the you know costumes and the rest of the casting and locations, which I love doing. Um, as opposed to then with Bump, I kind of wanted to um, prove that yeah, I was doing a feature at the end of the year, which was a bit of a gamble at the time whether it would happen with COVID. And I had been up for another show that was the whole show. And Shannon Murphy actually said to me, I'll do Bump, prove that you can just be a come-in director and direct because then you'll be able to get jobs in the future. So that was interesting because it was, um, yeah, doing episodes five, six, seven. So you don't get to um, choose – you only get to choose the actors who are in your block who haven't been on in new locations. Um, and Claudia and I had a few. She thought some of the stuff I'd chosen was a bit too slick – you know, and it was actually interesting because I was trying to push stuff and she was like, it's very grounded, it's very reality and to the testament of the show, it um, it was that and it ended up being such a success. But that was fun because it, um, it was still just as much work in a way, but you do pre-production by yourself really with like, so my first AD, we kind of did all the pre just together because everyone's on set. So you don't get any time with the DP, you don't get any time with anyone. So it's a bit different in that way. I, I have a very strict policy of always being honest. And uh, I think we, you know, I really enjoy interviewing you. And I don't want you to, uh, to dislike me at any point. But I do have to be honest. I did see all of the other guy. And I saw all of Bump. And I w wasn't a fan of either show. So that when you um, eventually, at some time, I'm going to, obviously, I'm going to review them. I don't want you to be angry at me or upset that, hey, well, why didn't he tell me that when I spoke to him? Um, I just wasn't a fan of, of either show. Bump especially, I had a, a lot of issues with about its claims to being realistic and I just didn't buy it. I just didn't think it was a believable show. I know it was a big hit and you're shooting a second series, I understand. Yeah, I'm yeah. not though. I'm okay. not on the second series. Right, but they, they, yeah. they, they've renewed it. So, I mean... You know, all, all power to them for their success. But just as a, as a viewer, I wasn't a fan of, of either show. With um, the other guy, I just got tired of seeing Matt Okine's bum, you know. <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> I enjoyed working on it because I liked I like working uh, in comedy. Like I think for me the difference with bump was that it was a more a drama um which was, you know, fun and, and, and stuff to work on. And I liked, but I think I, yeah, preferred other guy because I got, I liked having, yeah, comedians and I really loved Harriet. And, yeah. Yeah. Again, I, and that's I, like, you know, man in Australia. Every time I think I'm tired or busy, I just call him and he's doing like nine things. <laughs> just firstly, Otto on Otto, the yep. film that you've made about <laughs> Barry Otto, your father. Yep. Barry Otto is like, Seven Ways to Awesome, no question about that. But can you just tell me about, because we haven't seen it yet, what your approach was. This isn't a valentine to your dad, is it? A what? A valentine. What's that you. mean? Oh, like a love letter. I mean, have you made, uh, like, a, is it a tribute film to your dad? Or have you kind of got in there with the attitude of, I'm going to make a proper documentary about this this actor? It's um, it's an interesting one. I took a break from it for a few years because it's kind of started off as something and it's kind of ended up being about something else. But, um, you know, I think it's going to have where, you know, we've shot like 95% of it. So there's like not 
Yeah, but there, it does go through, you know, the 70s um, in Brisbane and, you know, Belvoir and, and all of that. But it's kind of about comedy and tragedy. Mm. And, and are, are you able, as his daughter, to take a step back from your relationship with him? And Yeah, no, I am. I think it's, yeah, it's been, that's why it's been a longer journey because it's a personal film. Okay. But, yeah. Now, you've got to tell us just a bit about <laughs> Seriously Red which I understand is about uh, a, a young lady who decides to change her life by becoming a Dolly Parton impersonator and gets involved in that world. And then I want you to tell me about Bikini Girls. So I can just go through. Bikini Girls is something that I'm not – it's weird. It's on my IMDb. But yeah. it, was, um, it was – yeah. It's weird. It, it's not something that I'm attached to, but I, I've met a woman, Ellen Elastopoth, who used to be the head of Warner Brothers in China. We've been wanting to – work on something together and I was attached to it and then I actually just saw it the other day on my IMDb and was like, oh, I'm not, yeah, I don't know what's going on with that, but I should get in touch with her. So I don't know why it's popped up on my IMDb in pre-production. Okay. <laughs> You've got nothing to do with it? No, not, okay. not at the moment, no. I was going to, you know, it was a film about some girls who come to Australia for a wedding, kind of like a Chinese bridesmaids, but set in Australia and a lot of Australian and Indigenous cast, um, but it was going to be potentially with a co-director, Chinese co-director, and it was yeah, it's only a few years ago that I kind of yeah was trying to work out how to get in the in the door. But I don't know, maybe it will circle back. But okay. she's a great producer, and she's doing a lot of stuff with Australia and China. Okay, and so. seriously, Red is that happening? Yeah, we're in post on that at the moment. Oh, that's, uh, yeah, yeah. So we shot that at the end of last year up in Byron, um, and Crew Boylan, who's at Dollhouse Pictures, she wrote the script and. She's the lead. She plays the Dolly Parton impersonator. So that was a lot of fun because it was, yeah, I didn't know if it was going to happen. It kind of came to me quite late in the process about directing it. And I was, so I went from the day after I finished Bump up into pre-production on it. Because you're very, very busy. You're very in demand. You're still doing uh, TV commercials? Yeah, I'm actually yeah. just in the middle of, um, I just did Zimmerman's fashion show the other right. day, which is a four-camera setup. So we've been editing that over the weekend. But yeah, I'm, I work every day on about five projects. Yeah, it's good for lockdown because it's been like I had good. Yeah, I just say I like to say yes to everything and and try new things. And you know, I think you got to ride the wave when the wave's coming. So I'm trying to keep as busy as I can. But yeah, I'm working on Dad's documentary. I'm working on post on the. Feature. I've been obviously working on Moth Effect. I've just done Zimmerman's show. What else am I doing? I know I'm doing something else. Oh, I'm pitching on another documentary at the moment. Just like, yeah, I'm all, uh, yeah. there's yeah. like about, I've got about nine different stickies here of all the different, yeah, pitching another TV show around with Daniel Cormack at the moment. Um, yeah, about to start a show, which I probably can't say, but a um, show that hopefully it got pushed back anyway. So we're just hoping that it, we find out this week if it's, if we start pre-production. Okay. Where did you get That's this fine. where did you get this work ethic from? Is this something that came from your dad? Oh, I think it probably came from my mum. But okay. um no, it's always I've always been someone that <clears throat> is like a not a hustler, but I think when you're a director, because I went to film school, people forget sometimes. I went to film school when I was seventeen. So I'm thirty four now. So in a way I've been in the industry for like fifteen years. But when I did, you know, yeah, there's Every, you know, every Saturday night, like, I'd be editing a fashion film or I think it was always about creating and generating stuff to have on the showreel to try and get the jobs I wanted to get. And then I think really because I had other guys, you know, it's a bit shit in Australia, but once you do one thing, people go, oh, you can, oh, she can direct TV. So at the moment I'm just trying to break over the barrier because I've done enough, done enough TV to show that I can do TV. I've done enough documentary now to do that, hopefully have the feature, do a bunch of ads. So I'm trying to just do everything and that's why I did the moth effect because I thought it was a different format show and I just thought you know that would be interesting to learn something new you're obviously very very busy and it would be very easy for you to really say to people who ask you for interviews look I just don't have time but it, just a very quick survey of the stuff that you've done even for under the volcano really shows, Gracie, that you're very generous with your time. Can I ask why that is? You'd have every excuse to say, look, I just don't have time to do a one-hour podcast interview. 
Well, I think, you know, I said to, I mean, I enjoyed when we did our interview from Last Empresario. I always remember that. But I think, you know, I said to Cody when I, I must have done about 70 interviews for the documentary in the last month. And, you know, she was like, there was one day when I was about to go shoot Zimmerman and I was doing a radio thing in the morning at 6.30 somewhere the other day in the car. And she was like, you don't have to do it. And I was like, yeah, but when people, when it's like positive as well and there's a buzz around the film, like you should be so lucky people want to talk to you. <laughs> And, you know, to then be like, oh, I don't, I don't have time to talk to someone, I think it's a bit, I don't know. I think, yeah, while you're, I think, it, you know, because when I first did Last Empresario, I just thought by finishing the film, it was going to, that was the achievement. And then the next day, my friend was like, oh, the article and variety in Hollywood Report is so good. And I was like, what? I hadn't thought about the fact that people then going to critique the work because I'd spent years, like, labouring away and I, I knew how proud I was of the film. And, you know, luckily it had good reviews, but it must be horrible to do a bunch of press when people hate stuff all the time. It, you know, so, I, yeah, and I kind of, yeah, so I, I don't mind talking to people. That, uh, to use the old phrase, you're seizing opportunities as though they were intended for somebody else. Yeah, I think that, you know, you get, especially as a female director, you get less of a chance. And I was so lucky that during... COVID that I we'd just finished shooting the documentary so we're in post you know bump was starting there was the chance of the feature and then the moth effect and I just kind of said yes to it all and then it all just because I spent years saying oh, I don't know if I could do that because I'm meant to be doing this and the reality is like at the moment I could have done bump I've said no to bump to do this other show and then this show got pushed back eight weeks because of COVID so now I've been but it's fine because now I've been sitting here on zoom every day in post and I wouldn't have been able to do all the interviews. I wouldn't have been able to, you know, finish the cut of the film. There was so much stuff that, um, you know, so in a way it's all worked out if it starts. But so I do think a lot of directors say, yeah, and I don't, I'm not someone who wants to make like two films in my life. I'd rather make 20. Like <laughs> I like to try new things. I'd like to do a Marvel film. That's the aim. That'd be awesome. Or uh, Birds of Prey, you know. <laughs> um, That's the kind of stuff I like doing, like fun, great chicks cool outfits, great music, you know. Create an Australian superhero, that would be something. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, I will make this the final question. You've mentioned a couple of times what it's like as a female director. You know, as a female director, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. You just mentioned it then. Gracie, can you just tell us, are you seeing a difference between female directors and male directors and how they – are both treated in the industry and what the opportunities are like. Is it, do you believe, harder for females at the moment? I think it definitely is. I think things are improving, which is great. But there's always, you know, people always listen to a guy over a girl on set about something technical or something, you know. I had it the other day when I was saying there was something wrong with something we were doing and everyone was like, yeah, 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 and then turned out what I was saying an hour later when they called the place was right and everyone was like, oh, you were right. And I was like, yeah, I was right because I told you what was wrong with it. But, you know, some tech guy had come over and said, oh, this is the problem. Everyone would have gone, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's little things like that that you kind of just go, oh, whatever. But I think, you know, it's, um, yeah, hopefully it would change for the – better um, and it is but like people like Jill Armstrong have fought for years to try and get more female directors and you know you become the minority because they say oh now we've got to have a female director on this or we've got to and it shouldn't be like we've got to it should just be you know but yeah hopefully things get better but that's why I think when you take the opportunity it's like you know people like Angie and Polly who gave at Aquarius who gave me the other guy that was a huge gamble they gave me a whole season of a show as a female director who hadn't done tv so Okay, that's no. Gracie. That's terrible. That's awful <laughs> to hear. You're on a set, and you're the director on a set, and you say something, and you kind of get yeah, yeah, and then some tech says it, and is a male, and he gets taken notice of. This is we're nearly into 2020. You just, used, you just get used to that, <laughs> like you know. Well, I always wear track pants and a beanie, and try to look at the least you know attractive as well on set so I can. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, you know now it's like I feel like the work kind of speaks for itself and I've, I've got enough stuff that you know now it's a bit easier I'm not having to prove myself as much but it's yeah it is what it is okay but that being said I've worked with so many incredible dudes like love working with men and you know it's not always the men that are the problem so it's yeah oh I have to say that in 2021 um that is it's still a bizarre thing 
to hear when you grow up in the 70s when feminism was on this huge wave, you thought, you know, oh, you know, by the year 2000, it's not going to be an issue. Yet we're now 2021 and it's still an issue. It's a little bit depressing to hear. Yeah, my mum, my yeah, she was like, every time I go to a women's march, she's like, yeah, we were doing this back in the 70s. Like, you know, she's always been like, it's a long, yeah. And, you know, like Jane Campion just won Best Film at Venice last night, you know, like, yeah, females are good directors. Mm-hmm. They're fa- fantastic directors and they've already proved that they can do everything. Um, there's yeah. no divide in terms of action, in terms of romance, in terms of anything. They might have a different approach that they're not um, any less successful or any less competent or any less efficient um, at doing anything. I'm starting to ramble, so I'm going to let you go. I want to thank yeah. you so much. Um, uh, the moth effect? Did you want to ask anything on the moth effect or are you going to talk to the boys? I, I am going to talk to the boys. If you Seriously, if you've got a couple of minutes to talk about moth yeah, effect, yeah. can you tell me, uh, just quickly, what were some of the other sketches that you did? You did the Brian Brown... Q and I did on. the Brian Brown one. I did. Um, I did the Jessica DeGale one. The I'm not a robot. Yes. I, like um, I did the Vincent and Bobby one. Right. Did, did you do the torture one with the woke yeah, cop? The one. I, yeah, with Pete. I did the Jen and Berries, which I really loved. That's um, brilliant. What's who's actor, that actress? In which one? In in the in the Ben and Jerry. Oh, Kate Box. Oh, God. Yeah. She she's was in great. She was in Little Death. Yeah, she's just like, she's a really good actor. She's just as good as comedy as she is at drama. You know how people like Rose Byrne can do comedy or drama? Like my sister can do comedy or drama. Like you can see them in such a dramatic role and totally believe them and see them as a comedian in that way. But, yeah, she was just like let her ad lib, you know. Okay. She's fucking great. Well, what was it like working on The Moth Effect? Because this was it new was- to you. Yeah, I mean, Craig was so lovely. He was the other director because I – we went on a break. I had a break all of a sudden. I, I was going to be – I was going to be busy up until we were nearly shooting and they were like, oh, you could just do pre at home. It was kind of – you know, it was low budget in that way. And then I went in and the scripts were so, in, like, intelligently written that I, I got my mum to read them because I was so overworked at the time and there were so many sketches and I just kept saying, just give me – don't give me any of the, like, weird Star Wars-y, even though I did the Star Wars one. Just give me the ones that I know about. But it ended up being that Craig did all the kind of exterior just because of the way it fell, and I did lots of the interior studio stuff. Um, and he was really helpful because there was just, yeah, I got my mum to read them all and send me a breakdown of every sketch because there were just so many of them. And then they finally divided them up, and I was like, great, these are mine. They're Craig's. Um but, yeah, like, I didn't understand the Hitler baby one at all. I was like, I'm not doing And then that ended up being one of the best ones. Um, so it was good that Craig got to do that one. But it was fun because it was, I mean, for production design and stuff, it would have been hell because it was, every day was, like, a different era. Um, but it was fun because it was only, like, four, you kind of did about a sketch, a sketch a day. Sometimes a sketch and a little bit of something else. So it was, like, four or five pages. And when you're doing TV, it's, like, eight, nine pages a day. So it was just like every day was like a different, so it was like, you know, Brian Brown one day and then the next day would be a completely, you know, like the um, who gives a shit sketch or whatever. They were all completely, I only got Brian's one because he could only do a certain date. Um, and I thought he must have loved QI because on the day, because that was the one he wanted to do. But then, yeah, when we were first talking in the morning, I was like, well, you know, it's like obviously a take on QI. And he's like, what's that? And I was like, like queer, queer eye, like the show, and he's like, I've no idea what that is, and I was like, Oh, so you just, you just like the script, did you? Like, he was so sweet, and um, yeah, it was just interesting working with actors and comedians because like a lot of the actors kind of turn up. I didn't do the one my sister did, but they like to, yeah, they like to know what they're doing, and they take like Peter Carroll take the text very seriously, and then you get the comedians like Nick and Jazz who just can ad lib, ad lib, ad lib, you know. Which Matt O'Kind does as well, like in that way, like and Harriet and I love, yeah, when they just get have that kind of more improv style. Was there an overarching philosophy to the show? Because it is a very particular type of, I would say, really well thought out, highbrow sketch comedy, very idea driven, very careful. I thought not to be too um, 
reference based. So I think a lot of these sketches are going to be funny in 10 years time. Whereas a lot of the comedy we're seeing now on TV isn't funny in 10 minutes time. And a lot of the cases, it isn't funny while you're watching yeah. it. But there seems to be like a universal uh, brief very, to the show. Be- like they're very, very, and you'll hear them, intelligent, Jazz and Nick. They're like, I don't actually understand half the words they say sometimes. Like the vocabulary they have is insane. And it's definitely based on the moth effect, which I'm sure they can answer a lot better than I can. But, um, yeah, they're like, you know, Jazz is such a great writer and such a great actor as well. Like I think, you know, it was I really enjoyed all his um, – all the bits he was in and, and Nick, you know, I, I kind of had, had known Nick's work a bit better just from, you know, those characters he's played before. Um, yeah, but it was just so much fun and it was like, yeah, it was just kind of, I don't know, I like when you can go to set every day and have a good laugh and go home. So it was a, yeah, interesting format as well, doing kind of these short standalone ones. Gracie, you've mentioned your mother a couple of times. Um, does she have an important part in your creative life at the moment? Oh, she always has. My mum was like one of the people who worked at Belvoir back in the day. She ran Company B. Um, and then, you know, it was very like me, but then had kids and just thought that she would go back to work and just actually fell in love with being a mum and then was a mum for like the last, what, 34 years um, and used to drive me to soccer every day and, you know, pick me up from school. And so she was really, especially in Last Empresario, she did a lot of work on my film. She read all the transcribes as well and she's got a – She's a very, like, intellectual woman. So she's been always across everything I do. And, um, yeah, she's just – and because she knows me so well, she's always one of the first people that watches stuff because she knows how to give the right notes that aren't, you know, going to offend me but <laughs> come from – and also, you know, notes that you know can actually – yeah, not just like I didn't get that. Like, critical – she's good like that. So, yeah, she's definitely the more insane part of my brain. You've got these little side projects that you do on YouTube, uh, Breakfast okay. with Various People, for instance. Very funny stuff there. I uh, know, no one's really seen them, but they're like, is this my friend Craig Deeker, Gingerbread Man, is a post supervisor, does all the post on my stuff, and he's one of my best friends. And when I used to travel all the time pre 2020, he was like, you meet so many incredible people and you've got such funny stories, but you've got nothing to show for it. And I guess all the people on there are like, yeah, I wouldn't want to necessarily do a feature-long documentary on them. And so I just, yeah, and I had a really funny editor, Walter. He, he's really good at cutting them to be quite funny. Um, so the deal is that I just spend, it's like 40 minutes, I turn up, and from the moment I turn up, I'm allowed to film, and the person's meant to cook me breakfast, but they're so, they're people that just don't cook breakfast if you watch them. There's like no one's actually ever cooked me a breakfast. They're kind of all worried about the fact that they're being filmed or Something, but it was, yeah, there's a really funny, it was just people that, like, Naomi Watts' mum, Miv Watts, like, I just think she's an eccentric, amazing woman. Everyone knows Naomi, but not so much her mum. So I did one with her. And, yeah, it's a mix of, like, fashion people and just eccentric. Like, Helmut Berger has to be one of my favourite ones that I did. Um, Just people I've met on my travels. So I would like to do a season two of it, but at the moment, lockdown and I'm busy. Well, they were very funny. And contrary to what you say, they got a lot of views. Yeah, I think yeah. some of them, I know, because my friend Phoebe Tonkin, I love her because she's, you know, she's got like 7 million followers on Instagram. She's always, I think she's just got a film now with like Brad Pitt and Margot Robbie. And I was like, good on her. Because she's always one of those girls that actually promotes other people and is the first to say yes and support other people when she's got such a huge fan base. It doesn't need to be. So I've always respected her in that way. And she said to me one day, oh, I want to do breakfast. And because she did it, then a whole bunch of other girls are like, oh, I'll, I'll do it, I'll do it. And she's always the first to, like, yeah, do something cool that's like, you know, she doesn't need to do my breakfast show. She's got enough followers. But I think her one had, like, yeah, 300,000 Yeah, I didn't see them all, but I did see uh, quite a few. I saw the Rachel Ward one. I saw the, the Damon Harriman one. I saw the one with the, um, I'm sorry, with the model. What's her name? She was in the Sea Folly um, thing oh. that you did. Not the Sea oh, Folly Madison. thing. Uh, you did a lovely short film. Oh, yeah, yeah, Madison. Yeah, she Ma- was yes, yeah. yeah. Um, so I saw, I saw um, you know, three or four of them. The Nick Broomfield one as well. Um, yeah. They were very funny, very well edited. And this, again, struck me is this is Gracie Otto actually taking advantage of the fact that she is in contact with these people 
and so yeah, yeah, comes out with a series one. idea and is taking advantage of the opportunity to actually create something. Uh, well, you've got to do, like I did a show last year that you probably missed called Small Town News and it was on every night. I did a half an hour show live every night for nine weeks in COVID and I had 200 guests on. So I would have people like who like Phoebe who've got 5 million followers and then I'd have like the neighbour next door who was funny, you know, whatever. And it was basically like shit news. So people would teach you how to make a bong out of children's textiles or Although, you know, I had a guy who came on from the bookshop and actually did, like, good book reviews. And so everyone got, like, three, four minutes and then I'd cut them off. And then it's actually on my Instagram. I did an awards night. And Sasha Haller, we all had, like, toothbrushes and we gave out awards. Damon Herriman won Best Skin. There was just, like, all these weird awards. But it was something that people still today text me every day saying, oh, can you bring it back? And I was going to bring it back during COVID. But that and the breakfast show were, like, you know, I say to people, it's like I did those for free because you have to generate work to get more work. And, yes, so is it was a lot of work for no money. <laughs> is that on YouTube? Is that available? Can you see it on YouTube? No, because the thing was I never recorded. There's two on my Instagram, like, feed or whatever. Not far down. It was, like, this time or well, last year. Um, so it's only, like, a few rows down. There's the finals night, which goes for an hour, I think. was this, And then there's the last episode, which is, like, a half hour on yeah. Instagram TV or whatever. Okay. Yeah, I should have recorded more because they were really like capturing the time of COVID as it happened, I think. Okay. Um, yeah, that was probably a bit of an oversight that you didn't record them, given how uh, you're saying how, how popular they were. I recorded a few, but like there was, yeah, it was like every day. I never had enough memory on my phone, but it was like 30 minute episodes <laughs> for nine weeks. Yeah. But there was so much content. Yeah. Never mind the phone. Just pick up a sh uh, point and shoot camera and uh, film with no, that. No, no, you can't do all that stuff. Like, and it got, it was over time and place. Like now, I think yeah, people like bring it back, and I was like, I don't. People are a bit more depressed now, and it it didn't have that kind of unknown what the fuck's going on. Like now we're like, oh, this is shit. Mm. How is COVID affecting you? A lot of people are talking about feeling a bit down, a bit depressing. It's now we're now in probably the worst phase of this crisis. Given I mean, I've been lucky that. I've actually had a great time. I bought an apartment, which was weird because I was I worked last year and I hadn't, you know, I went to LA. Um, I'd been living in LA and I never had any money and I just got lucky that, not that I made lots of money, but I had enough money to get a place. I've got this little one bedroom in Elizabeth Bay that I just love. So I just moved in here in May. Um, I love being on my own. Like every night I'm like, fuck, I'm going to have popcorn, I'm going to have burgers, I'm going to watch TV going to do what I want, going to have a drink. I'm like, I don't have kids. Like, I'm, I have my, yeah, I'm just by myself. So, and I, I really enjoy my own company. Like, I'll sit here and have a laugh about something or, but I have enough contact during the day. I've got Zooms all day, every day and shit going on that, yeah, the weekends I get a bit bored, but actually this weekend I did, we've got a pool in the building, I just realised. And so I went out into the, I haven't had a swim for like a year, but it was so hot that, um, yeah. But okay. I feel like it's been good because I've been able to catch up on so much stuff that would have been hectic if this show that I'm about to do had started. I would have been burning the candle ma massively at both ends.